We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. My name is Monika Krzyżanowska, I'm from Cloud Ferro, and I would like to welcome you. And in particular, I would like to welcome Christina Buszecka who, um, from Polish Space Agency, a co-host of this panel, and our distinguished panelists uh, from the world of Earth observation, Earth observation applications, science, industry, administration. Uh, normally, we should have with us Mr. Alain Arnaud, uh, Mr. Mr. Krzysztof Stereinta, who is with us, uh, Mr. Jędrzej Bojanowski, Mr. Oleg Dubowik, uh, who should connect remotely, and Mr. Stanisław Dałek, who is on site. I am, I am informed that there are some technical issues um, to connect um, uh, remote panelists. I hope they will be solved soon, but we shall start. So we should as well thank the organizers for this opportunity to discuss how satellite technology and in particular Earth observation contributes to the digital economy. As you know, uh, satellite observation is, is with us for over 60 years. The era of satellite remote sensing began with the Sputniks in 1957 and then followed by Explorer and Vanguard in 58. Today, probably more than a thousand observations, as we say, remote sensing satellites are in place. <clears throat> Those satellites carry sensors that measure different, different sections of visible infrared or microwave segments of the electromagnetic spectrum. Most, most of the satellites carry passive payload. They measure, observe, reflected solar radiation or emitted thermal energy. But some, have as well active sensor emitting energy and measuring reflected or, or backscattered response. When we talk about Earth observation satellites, we generally talk about the spatial resolution, minimum size of the object we can see, spectral characteristics, so what exactly the satellite see, which spectral channel, radiometric extent, how sensitive is the satellite, and temporary resolution. Resistance type, how, how often we can see the same area. Another aspect is the orbit altitude, the type of orbit, it can be geostationary or sun central. The data, images, images or scenes acquired by the satellite are transmitted to the, to the Earth, processed and stored in dedicated repositories for future use. For example, Sentinel-2 from mm -hmm from Sentinel Constellation provides, provides data from 13, 12 or 13 bands visible near infrared, shortwave infrared, and has a mean resistance time of 10 days to get the same angle for the, for the area. Its spatial resolution depends on the sensor. It can be 10, 20, 30, or 60 meters. And it's, uh, it's around, um, around the Earth, on an orbit at around a bit less than 800 kilometers. The images you can see or you, you, you see on the screen are examples from the Sentinel constellation from the Copernicus program. Copernicus is a common program of the EU. It is implemented in partnership of the member states with European Space Agency, European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, UPSA, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, ECMWF, EU agencies, and Mercator Ocean. Vast amounts of global data provided by Sentinel satellites are free and openly accessible to you. Since 2014, there are over 50, 70 petabytes of those data, and they are growing every day. Thank you, Monica, for uh, this introduction. I hope uh, it will bring satellites closer to, to our audience. 
And as it was said, uh, the images that I hope you can see um, are from the competition of this year. Um, as Polish Space Agency, we are trying to promote the idea that it's never too late to get into Earth observation, either to use uh, the products of Earth observation or uh, to start uh, serving such products and services. Um, I should add that Earth Observation and Copernicus is not the only program uh, of European Commission that brings us uh, valuable data of sat from satellites from orbit. We should remember that there is uh, Galileo and EGNOS, which bring us information about, for example, positioning, uh, GPS signal, and uh, it helps us not only in um, like geodesy, for example, but also, for example, in banking. And then the European Commission is working hardly uh, on um, satellite uh, connectivity and communication, uh, satellite communication. The program will be called GovSatcom. And uh, if anyone is interested in this data, so connectivity, nevertheless, of terrestrial network, uh, and in uh, remote places, like, for example, ocean, uh, you might want to visit uh, an trusted website where you find more use cases on uh, connection and satellite connectivity. Today we will focus on uh, Earth observation and well, we will discuss um, the, something that Frank Sandberg uh, said. They call space is the backbone of the new digital economy. Um, and we will start. Um, we will start with a short technical check. Uh, first of all, if you will have any question to our panelists, please write them in chat. We will check the chat, and uh, during Q and A, we will um, address the questions. And then I would like to uh, check if uh, Alain uh, Alain is with us. Still technical issues. So, uh, okay, let, let's just um, while waiting for Mr. Mr. Arno, let, let's shortly introduce him. So, when he joins in, definitely be yes. And we will so, on. we uh, invite Mr. Uh, Alain to, to join us uh, due to his extensive uh, knowledge on maritime. Uh, he is um, First of all, he uh, graduated from uh, Ecole Polytechnique uh, with his PhD in um, 1997. And uh, he co-founded a few companies. Uh, also, he has an experience with space, uh, French Space Agency and European Space Agency uh, in ESRIN. Right now, since 2017, he is leading in the digital transition at Mercator Ocean as manager of uh, one of the projects concerning um, collaboration with Elmetsat, and he's uh, an organizer of Digital Twin of the Ocean uh, Initiative. Moving from ocean to the forest, uh, Professor Sterenczak, um, Deputy Director of, uh, of Research and Science for the Forest Research Institute. He deals with broadly understood application of geomatics in the management and monitoring of the forest environment. And in particular, we've led um, several dozen scientific and implementation projects connected with forestry and forest, uh, forest um, related issues. Jędrzej Bojanowski, who is also with us here uh, in Warsaw. He's deputy head of the Remote Sensing Center of the Institute of Geodesy and Cartography in Warsaw. He received his PhD degree from International Institute for Geoinformation Science and Air uh, Observation. Uh, and his main domain is agriculture. Following agriculture, we wanted to shortly focus on air pollution. And we have invited Dr. Oleg Dubovi, who should hopefully is connected. He's not connected. He's not connected. So we, but hoping that we he will be able to mm. uh, to connect. We will just say uh, that um, uh, that he is um, he together that he is a 
CNRS, French National Science Center Research Director at the University of, uh, of Lille, and that he was working in the field of remote sensing of the atmosphere and Earth observation for many years, and at least 10 of those years were at, at NASA. He's an expert of, in the field of Earth science and reserved several professional recognitions. And our last panelist, Stasek, Stasek Dawek from Cloudfera, who will comment on technology and what we can do right now with um, observation data. So I hope you will uh, have this, this valuable uh, voice uh, on what we can do and why we even talk about accessibility of data. Coming back to the topic of our panel, could I invite in fact, to present us related use case? Yeah, uh, maybe I will start with introduction who can use and how the data are used in forestry. So I will say that there is a wide range of possible use. So we start from uh, forest fire, fires, which are hot topic, especially in the southern part in Europe and of course worldwide. Forest health uh, concerning the climate change is another issue which I think uh, changed a lot uh, from the practical point of view and I think uh, make the society open for uh, space-borne data. And of course, has a lot of uh, huge influence on the condition of forest worldwide. We have biomass, uh, we have uh, carbon storage, we have a growing stock volume. Those are the most important issue related to uh, forest characteristics and use worldwide. We have many products, uh, global products, for example, Globe Biomass, there was a, a project founded by ISA, which show us how the biomass is, looks like and how it changed during the time. Uh, of course, forest dynamic, uh, the uh, huge impact uh, uh, of what people are doing, uh, it's of course related to the how forest is changed and with use of, of multispectral data uh, and multi-temporal data, we can study this phenomenon. Of course, deforestation and afforestation are another issues related especially to, to uh, Southern America when we are really, uh, would like to see that the Amazon uh, forest will stay as it is now. And who can use it? Of course, I will say everyone. We have a policy makers which uh, create a policy based on the information taken from uh, earth observation data. We have governments uh, for some parts of, uh, of the world. Uh, the the uh, remote sensing data is only one uh, information source for them. There is no additional information. So uh, this is a crucial issue for them to have access to the, uh, to the remote sensing data. Of course, there are public institutions and, uh, of course, researchers which develop the algorithms to better analyze the data and, of course, to, uh, to push the technology forward. And on, on the end, there are practitioners, foresters, which use the products from the uh, earth observation data in the practice. So there is a huge branch of uh, uh, forest-rated remote sensing application in the market. Thank you very much. Uh, we're still waiting for the marine use cases. Use cases. <laughs> we will we will ask. Yes, we will uh, discuss some use cases of agriculture. Uh, so we can try this. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, well, I have to uh, start with what was already said with the new Copernicus program with Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 satellites, because these two satellites offer like unique unprecedented combination of high temporal and high spatial resolution. And this is a big change and opportunity for agriculture monitoring because it's for the first time we can basically monitor uh, each particular field knowing what's growing there and how it's growing. Of course, with some limitations, but in general, it's the first time we can on the large scales 
country scale, regional scale, we can do that. And that's a really a game changer. And um, so for the use cases, uh, we, we are just about to finish two big projects um, in cooperation with the Space Research Center of Polish Academy of Sciences, funded by European Space Agency and the National Center of Research and Development. So uh, to exploit Earth observation data, satellite data for Statistics Poland, so the Na National Statistical Office, and the PAIC agency, which is responsible for, this, for paying the subsidies to farmers uh, under the common agriculture policy. So for Statistics Poland, uh, the, the, the objective of the project was to get the statistical information on agriculture production. And for this, you need uh, like two, two sides. One thing is we, we, we need to know the area of the crops sown, so we need to recognize, identify crops on the field. And the other aspect is the, the expected crop yields for the unit area. So the multiplication of these two sites, you can get the crop production. So we build a system, uh, operational system, uh, in, and it, it, it runs in, in statistics Poland, uh, getting an automatic information on crop production assessment uh, along the season. So this is one implementation of the... Of the... If I may add, sure. I've heard that that's the only such use for statistics in Europe. Uh, I also heard that. I so yeah, I'm happy that we were able. To Congratulations! Make, so thank you to to start. Uh, I mean, I think it, I think it's not the first attempt to use Earth observation, but it's the first operational system, and it's really implemented on 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 site there. So this is one use case, and the second use case is uh, for paying agency uh, because paying agency needs to control the farmers' declarations uh, based on which the farmers are paid. So there is a second system, also operational, where we uh, create reports on each field that was um, that was um, declared for 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 the subsidy, where we checked if the crop zone is the one it was it was declared, if the agri agriculture activities were performed according to some rules. We checked if the vegetation cover, which is necessary to be maintained against the um, uh, soil erosion is, is, is there um, and some other more detailed aspects. And this is also very important, this implementation, because since Statistics Poland is not obliged to implement anything, bank agencies are obliged and all member states, European member states are, are obliged to start so-called control by monitoring, satellite monitoring, I think starting in 2023. So next year, our system will be like in a pre-operational, I mean, it's operational, but it will be like a, a phase uh, at the beginning uh, to be sure that, uh, that Poland will comply with the requirements of common agriculture policy. And, uh, as, and the last word is uh, that uh, none of those would be possible without the IT infrastructure we, we use for, for uh, where the data is stored, but I guess we will talk about it later. So. But you already started a little bit the discussion about the maturity of the services and the technology of course as well. So uh, I just want to check if Oleg is with us and he was able to connect, uh, but I cannot see him, um, neither hear him. But I, since I think it's a very important part of the, of the panel, this air, air pollution, I think we should at least show the audience what what Definitely. are the topic we would like to we, we wanted to address, uh, and to say that the great advantage of the space for observation of uh, of, of air pollution is that they are very, provide very quick global regional coverage. So and they are neutral; they can be observed without without affecting. And uh, so, the, but still, mm, those. Those measurements are probably at the beginning and need much more targeted observation. The space missions related to air, to, to air observation are quite expensive. Uh, and of course, the resolution is still not satisfactory to, to say or to tell if your backyard, the air in your backyard is clean 
I, I think what is also important to say about uh, atmospheric and uh, atmospheric applications is that this is a kind of application that is uh, quite similar to uh, what uh, is being done with weather forecasting. And what wasn't said uh, before regarding the general mechanics of uh, the satellite uh, observation satellites is that most of the uh, imagery uh, related obs uh, observation satellites that we're discussing are a low orbiting satellite satellite that orbit on uh, on uh, polar orbits uh, that are uh, seven, eight hundred kilometers high, and uh, the revolution lasts uh, around two hours. While uh, for atmospheric uh, applications, uh, it is uh, often very important to be able to uh, stay over one point over the Earth uh, all the time to target the same area to have a uh, to have a uh, not to have a revisit time, but to have a constant view of a given area, uh, and such satellites are geostationary satellites that orbit much higher than, uh, than the low orbit. It is the, the stationary of orbit is 36,000 uh, kilometers. We are trying to optimize uh, the use of orbits as well, <laughs> and we have to protect them. Uh, I hope our audience will remember that even though satellite imagery provides us valuable information, and on that we will discuss more, uh, we have to remember that they either are checked by uh, data from other um, sources or they are complemented. And the aid, the atmospheric, the climate information are a very good uh, example of that because without sensor uh, on Earth, uh, we, the information that are provided by satellites is very limited. Only with the combination of both data, we can, uh, we can actually understand what's going on. Okay, so uh, following this talk, you have spoken a little bit about the application of um, air observation and remote sensing into agriculture. And I'd like to ask Renka, uh, how how does it look from the forestry point of view? Is it as mature as for the agriculture? Uh, are there in situ data, more in situ data needed? Yeah, I would say that uh, the experience with use of uh, uh, remote sensing data in general uh, for forestry use is, of course, wide and old. I would say it starts from the beginning. Uh, so there is a multiple uh, applications. Uh, of course, this depends on the country, on the infrastructure, uh, know-how, because we know that the data itself is kind of information to really provide a, a suitable information need to be proceed, uh, process. And on the end, uh, there are some valuable information. Uh, but for example, uh, we know that there are a huge group of people working on the global scale. So there is a lot of programs uh, checking how the forest looks like to the whole world, especially in the Amazon. Uh, as I said, there are special uh, there are systems dedicated to forest fire. Uh, Europe, I would say, it's, uh, uh, I would say the, the, the use of data is more on a homogeneous homo, uh, to, to provide a homogeneous information about the forest because we know that uh, forestry is like. 300 years already of history, how to uh, protect and manage the forest to provide the wood. So in Europe, for example, there is a huge uh, history of forest management. So basically we have a maps of each specified part of the forest, but then uh, the uh, forest uh, definition or the forest management strategy on each country is a little bit different. So when we want to have information on the regional scale, on the European scale, it's that, that then we have a problems with some definitions, uh, some uh, issues related to uh, how we see the forest, what the role of the forest is. So I think the uh, and this is what we can see, there are programs, uh, for example, forest, uh, European Forest Institute start the program uh, to have a homogeneous, uh, similar, from the meteorological point of view, information of the uh, forest status in Europe. 
uh, when you think about Poland, uh, this is a once again specific situation. Uh, we have a forest, uh, a national holding state forest, which is a huge company managing about almost 80% of uh, our, our forest. So they have a unique and similar uh, uh, digital system which in which they store uh, almost 200 variables related to the forest. So uh, of course the permanent monitoring of forest health, I think this is a, a crucial issue related to the dynamic changes in the forestry going on, not only in Poland, but worldwide. So I would say to summarize, depends on which part of the world we are talking about. The use of uh, spaceborne information is different, but mm -hmm. if you want to have a similar information about the forest in Europe, in the world, we, we, we wouldn't do this without the uh, remote sensing data. Um, maybe, so we discuss uh, the forestry and how it's needed. We also heard how available data are for agriculture, but then let us understand if uh, those data, the services, because data is one thing, but then you are processing the data, you're offering the services. So is that for everyone or it's just for large institutions like statistical office, the uh, institution responsible for forestry? Uh, what benefits has uh, have ordinary person? Maybe let's start with agriculture okay. because I know Poland is seen as agriculture country. Yeah. Well, it's it's not it's complex question I would say because <clears throat> um, I guess. For the institutions, it's maybe easier to formulate the user needs because this the dialogue. It's you know you, you have a, you you discuss with one entity or two entities, so uh, this may be a bit more straightforward, although still difficult because all sides uh, need to learn you know the, the, what is really needed, what is possible, what are the limitations. And that's that's always a, a long process. But in terms of agriculture for for public, I mean, of course, we have a, a, a huge parallel, I would say, uh, field, which is the uh, precision agriculture, where you use it observation data as well. Um, so, and of course, then the information is more uh, dedicated to individual farmers or or companies. Uh, having like a bigger area, but still looking at particular fields. And I say that it's a, a bit parallel because I mean, the methods are quite different. We are not yet there where we can use really precise information on fields, uh, even within fields and then aggregate it to be, to, to be uh, available information for institutions, like I mentioned, like statistics Poland. Probably we'll get there at some point, but I think the benefits uh, for ag precision agriculture, mainly the fertilizers, uh, measurements where you have to water plants were not, so optimization, uh, reduce costs, um, probably a bit of uh, yield forecasting at, the, at, at each field, um agriculture activities uh, support by 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 satellite also indirectly because the, the navigation is also satellite uh, part but, so before so. i will ask for whom data and services uh, of the forestry i would like to um check with you uh one thing about in situ data i remember uh, i was talking with statistic poland and uh, they told me that the validation of data and the service that you mentioned about um, took them two years to find out if what the satellite says it's and you think it is it it's really there. Yeah. So I mean, um, without in situ data, we cannot do much uh, because we cannot not only validate but we cannot train the model. And to learn, I mean, of course, there is a long history of observation, so we, we have some knowledge about, you know, what the satellite signal means for, uh, for I mean, 
what physical properties of, of plants, for example, lead to a certain signal. In agriculture, one, th one thing is uh, easier to measure, which is just to have in-situ information about crops, because this is very objective to a certain extent, but let's say we can recognize crops on the field. Uh, and this is um, this was done by Statistics Poland in field campaigns for many years, and it's a huge effort because there are like thousands of points in whole Poland, so it's a cost is really high. Uh, the solution is the farmer's declaration because then we have many more points, uh, but uh, subject to uncertainty because since we need to control farmers, it means that we assume that maybe there are errors there in this data. But which is more tricky is the information on crop yields because this is not so easy to measure. It's not so, um, it's, it's a bit sub subjective because uh, one thing is biomass, one thing there are grains, uh, quality of grains and so on. And this is, a, this is still a, a really limiting uh, factor. Uh, I think the only solution for that to have the homogeneous data on this is probably, um, synchronization of, of uh, the detectors on harvesters. And I know that European Commission thinks about it to have a common standard for data because without this, it's really difficult to go forward because the number of sites where we have data is really limited. I mean, for, for uh, modern machine learning techniques, we need like really huge samples. So, so yeah. Yes, I, I think this issue of data homogeneity is uh, generally something we see across. We have quite a panoramic view of the different use cases uh, of, of observation data. Uh, and we, all, uh, we often find that uh, the users of our platform, we run a platform for processing, uh, for processing that observation, storing and processing that observation data. We often see that users uh, need a uh, need spend a lot of time on homogenizing data when they need a long time series very often uh, the most ancient data comes from uh, in situ observations that were that have uh, different degrees of uh, certainty and of quality then they have data from several generations of satellites that have quite incompatible uh, uh, data, both formats and uh, instruments, uh, instruments precision. And this leads to, especially in machine learning where the source data is uh, very important, it leads to many difficulties and uh, bases. So th this, this is the major effort. And talking about, uh, uh, talking about the, this, fields of applications and uh, users of the technology. I, I think the, the trend that is now happening is uh, that we see a, a large democratization of this of observation data, something that was once reserved to uh, military, then to big institutions and scientists. Uh, then uh, comes the industry, uh, commercial businesses that make more and more uh, use of this uh, data. And then uh, the, the challenge now is to simplify the technology uh, enough to make, make it accessible to students, to citizens, ultimately, who, uh, to, to make it uh, much easier to access and consume this data and extract information out of it. Yeah, but I think European Commission is um, adding extra mile when it comes to uh, making data available. Mm -hmm. And I think ProDS is one of the examples of the hub. And Monica once showed me uh, how the platform works, and I'm not a uh, scientist. I'm not even remotely uh, connected to imagery, and it was super easy to use. Mm -hmm. But um, then you mentioned another very important topic that everyone basically can now do Earth observation satellite. So as I said at the beginning, it's not only that everyone can use it, not everyone can uh, analyze it. I mean, yes, everyone can analyze it, but it's not reserved. Everyone can participate in, in exploration of our Earth to understand what's the processes. But I would like to get back on the users and, and cases. Um, and 
um, in situ data, homogeneous in situ data was a challenge, is a challenge in agriculture. Is it in the forestry as well? Yeah, I think even even more. <laughs> I mean, why? Uh, yeah, we we say about uh, forests that there are not crops. Uh, you cannot find really many forests, one species, one generation. When we talk about forests now, especially reflecting the EU uh, politic, uh, we we talking about biodiverse forests, multi uh, layer. So it makes things more complicated. So yeah, there is a lot of limitation with use of uh, earth observation data, especially spectral one. Uh, we need 3D data for forestry, uh, and when we, it comes to to the in situ data, you know, so you have very different forests to the world. Uh, you have different species composition. You have different age classes, which means that you 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 should have information on the single tree level. The example of such a very good in situ data, for example, from our from Poland, is a project which I. I managed this was a Rambio 4 from a national center of uh, uh, research. Uh, uh, so there were we cut three and a half thousand trees uh, to measure exactly how they uh, uh, the volume of at the single tree level, and then we move to to uh, to the uh, the volume, then to carbon storage and biomass. But this is just one tree. Now, when you consider the on the on the sample level, there is this can be even. 40, 50 uh, individual, then you can you know, to generate this information on the sample, but this is still a sample. And then, yeah, and then you need to transfer it to the, to the uh, let's say, country. Uh, so th th there is a lot of issues. So what we can see, uh, there is wide use of urban lizard scanner data or maps as wall-to-wall -wall information, which are uh, widely used either for calibrate models uh, with use of, uh, of uh, yeah, space borne remote sensing data or to evaluate the quality. So I think for the practical forestry, for the really single precision forestry, there are some data on the market. Of course, we need to pay for that, but after we move to, let's say, one meter resolution worldwide for free, uh, I think we'll be in the place where everyone wants to be. <laughs> Are we moving to one meter resolution? <laughs> for free, I hope. Yeah, that's that's the point, for yeah. free, because yeah. as you said, commercial... Access. Yeah, you know, we need to update information. There are some dynamic uh, things, for example, bark beetle issue in Czech, Germany, Poland, yeah. US. So you, uh, everyone wish to have, uh, let's say, every week, every two, three days, precise information, and then we can use it for management. Otherwise, if we have a once or two times uh, per month, or even a half year time, one or two images, we cannot really use this in the operational forest. Yeah, this is the case. Understood. I'm checking time, and we have some time for maritime. So uh, we have, yeah, yeah. I, I understand that I know it's still not with us, uh, but I think that our panel wouldn't be complete if we could say at least a few words about the use of remote sensing for maritime applications. So, uh, of course, I, I'm not being an expert, I cannot tell you all that should be said here, but I still can say that um, Earth observation data are very widely used uh, in the ocean and um, marine, marine application. That there are over 30,000 users for Mercator Ocean, which is a European organization, that they are what's called uh, Copernicus Marine Services. Product and that they include, for instance, such information. They are available to everybody as global ocean chlorophyll band modeling and temper temperature measurement of the ocean, water mass and heat exchange. So there there is a really huge amount of data and information and services related to this very very important. Topics. Yeah, I wanted to add on that yeah, oh yes. yeah, about maritime because this is a quite unique uh, field in Earth observation uh, because it's something we cannot do without Earth observation at all, I would say. And this was the same for polar regions. I mean, that the first, so, you know, people starting with Earth observation, I don't know, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, 
uh, on land, especially in Europe or US, you, can, you, you have a lot of information from the ground, from the field service, but on, on, on the ocean, like there is no, no other ways. And uh, which is a challenge because it's lack of in situ data. But on the other hand, you can, you know, you can provide some information that, you know, something really, really new. So it's quite exciting field. Right? So, yeah, and we see all those pictures from the competition that very often shows the beauty of ocean. But at the same time, we better understand what our action casts uh, when it comes to ocean's health and yes. sea health. Yes, and uh, ocean is two thirds of our globe. Yeah. That's why it is pretty yeah. important to take care of. That. Yeah, and we have also yeah. the very dedicated application, uh, the services that helps tourists plan the vacation. So going from the global scale, understanding what's on the earth, we also can uh, apply it to our everyday life. Yeah. And also the other issue is that since the resolution, the special resolution is not so important, Probably there are some aspects that still it's it's in, in important, but so, so what we benefit we can have uh, information for like forty years now on the, about the ocean. There's something we cannot when we talk about Sentinel two or so high resolution we can use. We have five years of data and it's really limited what you can do for the ocean. I mean, of course, there are some aspects on also on data homogeneity and there are a lot of works on on that. But um, but you can really observe long term changes. For yes, uh, on the contrary, uh, with the modern cell like that, that higher resolution, higher resolution rates, this enables new uh, possibilities for uh, like uh, fisheries monitoring, uh, all uh, monitoring of all illegal, potentially illegal stuff that happens at sea. Uh, these are the new applications that are enabled with uh, high resolution, uh, high frequency. Including, including pollution. Including pollution, including of course. Pollution. I often get a question because my role is to promote data, satellite data to, for example, public administration. I often get a question how often I can get an information. So it's very important also to, as it was already said, uh, to have dedicated infrastructure. and. Now, well, we introduce you, uh, Mr. Staszek, as uh, someone who will comment on technology. Yes, so I was uh, I was injecting my few words into this uh, previous conversation, but uh, generally the challenge uh, of, uh, of observation data is around uh, its uh, variety of sources and volume of the data. This is one of the of the big data uh, areas. Uh, the quantities of this data augment uh, massively with the number of satellites flying around uh, with higher visit times and with higher resolutions. And all, the, all those factors multiplied result in an explosion of, uh, of the quantity of uh, data we are talking about. So uh, 10 years ago, people used to uh, acquire this data from different sources because in order to do something useful with the data, you, you usually, as, uh, as it was said, you usually need to combine data from different sources. You need uh, multispectral imagery and radar, for instance, or you need to combine it with some in situ data. And very often to combine data, if it's a long time series, but if it's a long analysis from different uh, satellites that were around some years ago. And in order to do that, you had to gather this data and spend, uh, spend a lot of time on uh, assembling, uh, downloading and making it homogeneous. You also had to have a huge data center to uh, process this data and to do something useful out, out of it. Uh, nowadays, you with a platform such as uh, Trail Dias run by uh, South Ferro or uh, Wikio, which are we are also participating too, you can uh, get this data assembled and uh, homogenized in, the, uh, in one uh, big database that is searchable and where you can access the data uh, easily. And you can just rent the processing power that you need. You don't need to own the data center to process 
data at uh, regional or uh, even our, uh, at global uh, scale to run a, a huge processing campaign. And this all makes uh, the technology more and more accessible to, uh, uh, to everybody. Uh, as I said before, it is, uh, this, there is this democratization of technology and the major challenge right now is to simplify the technology. Uh, we uh, often see uh, the major group of users are scientists uh, or institutional users, and they are not necessarily experts in uh, mass parallel data processing. And this is what a platform such as ours brings to the table, but it makes it easy to scale the processing up to the level of, uh, of a global processing campaign. You just need to know uh, and to understand your uh, specific matter, whether it is forest or, uh, or uh, agriculture or other applications, uh, and to know the imagery or, uh, or radar data processing um, uh, processing uh, algorithms that are necessary to extract the information uh, that you need. The platform performs the scaling uh, for you, and this is this is a great advantage. So the challenge, uh, so our we see simplification of uh, data processing as our mission, but our vision is to engage more and more people. Uh, in it to make it more available uh, for everybody and to make this engagement uh, bilateral, I would say, to, uh, so that uh, users, uh, this is uh, very much uh, oriented with the, uh, connected with the um, in-situ data, that ultimately uh, with the proliferation of uh, IoT and uh, handheld devices and all sorts of sensors that people carry on with them, uh, more and more data will be coming from uh, citizens and uh, users themselves. So there will be a closed feedback loop to feed such data and to make it, uh, to combine it with the satellite data to make it even more useful. I can see the Facebook with air observation data and everyone providing information for the combination, which is very beneficial, I assume, if we want to have an uh, information what's where and from one meter, less than one meter resolution. Uh, but at the same time, well, it's, it's somewhere where we are going. I think uh, in uh, considering the general social situation uh, nowadays it is very important that uh, satellite data provides this objective data that is uh, that we can say it's ground truth but it's space truth yes thank you Sasha. Uh, if i may just yeah, one, yeah. add one uh, one sentence because we, we mentioned a few times that uh, imagery is often covered by cloud uh, and that when uh, that's the case when we are dealing with uh, electronic uh, satellites. Uh, radar satellites uh, enable us to observe in the night and nevertheless the uh, cloud uh, situation. But then I want to just point out that European Space Agency is highly promoting solutions that enable satellite to recognize if the uh, image is cloud uh, covered by cloud or not to not download uh, imagery that is not needed and save also some money. Uh, I think that we are slowly going towards the end of our panel. So I'd like to ask the panelists to comment on, on one of the two topics, but having in mind, we have, we have mentioned two times the um, modeling uh, digital in Earth. We focus more, more on measuring but then what about the modeling about the future? And the, one of the two topics which we would like you to comment is, can, keeping in mind the digital green earth and model, can those data make earth a better place? Or is a digital economy is now new space and observation data? Could it start with? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think the answer is obvious, yes. <laughs> but uh, mm, I think that uh, I, I just want to comment one. I think that it's I, I would avoid 
statement that uh, earth observation provides always uh, real data or let's say uh, not reference but uh, real data this depends there was a there was a huge discussion about uh, GRC paper in nature about the deforestation. Uh, my colleagues from different uh, countries were really, uh, disappointed with the conclusions. So there was a, another paper in science, in nature, sorry, uh, guided by uh, director of forest research, European Forest Institute. Uh, and I would say the, the conclusion were different. So I think that the, the, the we, we, we really want all people to really use the data, but they need to have a knowledge. Uh, otherwise, we make Facebook from the uh, science. So everyone who have an account is an expert in Facebook. Uh, we, can, we need to avoid this in, uh, in the science. There need to be uh, uh, really know how, pe uh, how people process the data, what were used to evaluate the uh, uh, quality of the product, this should be uh, open uh, and free available. Everyone can check it and have a discussion. I think we should rather think how to communicate in, in this time because uh, there is so much different data available. And I think it's always hard to uh, decide what should I use, especially the technology really changed dramatically. And for example, we had in forestry, Abram laser scanner data introduced a long time ago, and there is many studies how we can use it, but not many places will use it. And now that we are talking about pool space, Abram laser scanner data, now we have a full way from Abram laser scanner data, and the science is here, practice is here, so the gap between uh, is growing. So I think we should first think uh, how we, having access to the data should communicate and talk about quality, talk about products, not against each other. Uh, and this is the issue, I think, especially, of course, we have a policy makers. They, I hope, uh, create a policy based on the data, but on the end, we have a public uh, or even a, a, a NGOs, which can check the data and maybe has different conclusion, conclusions. So on the end, those experts who've done the work need to meet and agree what, how and why they have these differences and uh, different outputs of the uh, study. So I think we have very nice times. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, we have, uh, there was uh, 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 images from far, uh, uh, there was a 1997 program uh, where they collect uh, data for Poland. Uh, there was a, a airborne based images and they were very poor quality everyone argued, but they we all were happy that they were and now we have access to sentinel almost daily information we have of course different platforms which can make an image of the earth every day so they are very challenging and nice times but i think we should concentrate how to communicate and understand each other yeah that's even at my work very uh of very easy to observe gap. You mentioned the science uh, and, for example, industry. I often feel like there's not enough discussion and uh, industry brings a perspective often, not always, but often brings the perspective what's needed. They bring the understanding of market and scientists often focus how to do it. What's the challenge? How to solve the problem? And when we're talking about forestry, for example, this is what was mentioned. The new technology didn't provide much new information. Easier way, maybe access every week, etc. So the issue is to understand each other. I think this is the, the key question because sometimes scientists cannot understand. So how we can expect, uh, let's say, foresters to understand scientists? <laughs> so this is uh, something. <laughs> I observe in the chat, if there are any questions, uh, please uh, please send us uh, the question. We still have a few minutes and now the agriculture, Mr. Yerzhen. Um, okay, I can, I can try to merge answer for both questions you asked. Because one thing we also, because to make it a better place, um, one thing is that we want to understand the processes on earth. And something we didn't maybe mention yet is that, that maybe, 
even in a bigger extent, satellites are used to assimilate to models that describe what's going on Earth. And this is, it. maybe it's less uh, visible for users, but it's probably if you count the amount of data which is really used every day, more is it's used in the models that describe weather, interactions between land and ocean, land and atmosphere and so on. So this is one thing. And in, in um, talking about agriculture, I think there are huge opportunities, but we have to use the data wisely if we want to make a profit for us. Because one thing is that we can optimize, identify uh, agriculture production, but with the costs of biodiversity loss, because of um, uh, uh, greenhouse gases emissions and so on. But on the other hand, if we if we use it to really uh, like in the farm to fork strategy under the European Green Deal, if we want to make the, the food more healthy and to agricultural production more sustainable, we can. I cannot imagine this without support of Earth observation. So I guess. Depends on our objectives. We can use it in a good way, but also in a, in a bad way. Always depends on us. Yes, uh, maybe I will start with uh, saying that uh, when we prepared for the discussion, Monica and I, and uh, we met for the first time with our panelists, I had this feeling that digital economy is not any longer possible without uh, data from satellites. Either it's imagery, navigation, positioning, and soon to be also um, connection, connectivity in um, remote area. Today, it was uh, said that uh, satellite data, satellite imagery are often the only source of data for places like oceans and very often uh, also on the land where there's no terrestrial infrastructure or no data from other sources and to understand what's going on in the earth and how we can uh, either help to uh, build healthy society we need uh, data that are basically simple data not an information that is processed but uh, that bring us larger perspective and we have it thanks to satellite imagery uh we discuss also that uh satellite imagery is almost for everyone not everyone can process the data but everyone can benefit uh from it and i think that's very very important to understand that it's not about large institution it's not about um only scientists it's not finally about just people who are uh, space geeks that's also about every single citizen and I hope that that's something that our audience will learn from our discussion. I think I don't know if that will oh, I think we're, something. We're, we're fine. So I think that I can only say that you have summarized our discussion, mm -hmm. but I hope we have convinced our audience that yes, our observation data is there, satellite technology is there. It's a tool to be used by us for the better play, for the earth to become a better play. Yeah, uh, I see there is no questions on the chat, but uh, if you would like to ask, I mean, uh, people who are on site or online, as a group with organizers, you can ask on Twitter with, uh, with, uh, with the hashtag of our session, which number is 108, and we will answer later on. Uh, I see one, one comment from, uh, from Mark Urban. Thank you very much. And this is about the... Uh, Mark wrote about infrastructure. There is a group of research and education networks that are gathering to promote the use of the existing connectivity, uh, infrastructure for observation. Jean in Europe, Red Clara in Latin America, Astron in Arabic countries are members of GEO. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so thank you very much for this comment. Mark is uh, saying. And just to answer, to, to comment on Mark's comment, uh, our platform, CrowdIS, is obviously connected to Jean's. Uh, so, scientists have good access to, to that data. Okay, thank you very much then. I hope you will discuss about usage of uh, satellite imagery in next uh, possibilities and opportunities. Thank you.